This is Gardening in America, and I'm Ed Hume. Today we're on the island of Maui in the Hawaiian Islands, and I'm at the Enchanting Floral Gardens with Joseph Texera. Joseph, these gardens are beautiful. Whereabouts on the island are we situated? And we're located in Kula on the slopes of Haleakala. Yeah, it's gorgeous. The gardens are outstanding. What are the plants behind us here? Uh, these purple flowers are akulikuli. Uh, they're from South Africa. Oh, I noticed throughout the garden that you have plants representing many countries. Yes, we do. And a lot of them are South African, aren't they? Uh, lots of South African plants here. Okay. What other countries would be represented? Uh, we are from Brazil, Mexico, and a lot of plants from Indonesia. I know some that uh, I've seen in Australia and in, in the South Pacific, and I guess they probably come from the countries that you've mentioned, but they're grown extensively there, too. Near the entry area, Joseph, you have beautiful vines, red, gorgeous. Yeah. What are those? That's a Tahitian jade vine. A little bit further on, then, you have some blue ones. Yeah, that's a blue Tahitian jade vine. So it's a, a same family, yeah, but same it's just... same family. Okay. And I noticed throughout the gardens, um, the signing is very nicely done. Yes. And you have it not only in English, but you have it in another language, too? Yes, we have it in Japanese. We have a lot of Japanese visitors. They love botanical gardens and oh. really enjoy it here. Oh, I'm sure. Now, are the gardens privately owned? or? Uh, yes, it's privately owned by Mr. and Mrs. Kazuo Takeda. In addition to all the flowering plants here on the grounds, you have um, some of the outstanding uh, proteas, which I think are really spectacular plants. Yes, people love to the protea plants a lot. That's used a lot as a cut flower too, isn't yes, it? Yes, it's an industry here in Hawaii. Uh, protea cut flowers, they grow very well here. They have vibrant colors in Hawaii. And the thing that I noticed also is up around one of the gazebos, you have an orange ground cover uh, vine. What vine is that? Yeah, that's the orange trumpet vine. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's a great ground cover. Yeah, and you, of course, have used a lot of other vines, too. I noticed, for example, the mandevilla. Yeah, that's really pop. People love that plant. You know, I can grow that at home in the Pacific Northwest, but I have to bring it in during the winter. And I think that's something that's of an interest to a lot of our viewers, is that uh, many of these plants, although they're tropical plants, can be used as house plants too. Indeed. You can bring them indoors and put them outdoors in a nice weather. When's the best time to visit the gardens? Uh, anytime is fine. The weather is usually really nice here all year round. When are you open? We're open from 9 to 5 daily. Is there an admission fee? A nominal fee. Okay. Yes. Thank you for sharing the enchanting floral gardens with us. You're They're welcome. absolutely beautiful. <music> Latest winter and early spring is a great time to plant glads and dahlias. And you know, you want to select the brightest, sunniest spot in the whole garden for both of them. They do best there. Although the glads will do part, good in part sun and shade too. This is a glad corm, and the pointed end is always up. The concave section here is down. Now it's exactly the opposite on tuberous begonias, and that's why I mention this. In this planting hole, I'm going to put five corms of glads. Now, I've got the hole ready and I've already added organic humus, processed manure, and some compost. I'm going to add a little bit of fertilizer, a non-burning fertilizer, and then I'm going to mix them all together so there's nothing in the root zone that will burn these corms of these glads. Now, the reason why I plant so many in one planting hole is that it's first of all a lot easier and second of all if Myrna wants to come out, Myrna's my wife by the way, wants to come out and pick one or two of the stalks for flower arrangings, it's not going to ruin the display at all. Now these are about six inches deep into the soil. Planted that deep then they'll support themselves, they don't need supporting. And the next thing I do is simply pull the soil in over the top of them and it's that easy. I've still got five corms to plant in another area too. Then let's go over here and, and plant some dahlias. And there's a couple different ways to do dahlias. Already I put the stake in the middle. I've already added the compost and the processed manure and I'll add a little bit of fertilizer there as well. And if you have a whole bunch of 
of dahlia tubers from last year, then maybe instead of the stake, you'd just simply take two tubers and plant them fairly close together. Then as the stalks grow up, they'll support each other, and that's your staking. You really don't have to have this stake then at all. But since I bought these, and by the way, this is this beautiful yellow flowering variety here, and it will grow about four feet high, and that's why I've got the stake here. So rather than to waste my money, I'm going to plant the one tuber in this planting hole. Everything's ready, the non-burning fertilizer, the compost, full sun, well-drained soil. That's really what dahlias like too. You know, in fact, they're from Mexico, so they take a lot of heat. And is what I'll do is set them so that the eye is upright. Keep in mind on a dahlia, the tubers tend to go out sideways. So don't try to plant them down. You know, some people try to plant them like this. Plant them upright like this. If you do, they'll really grow well. That's all I have to do. Fill in only about an inch of soil at first and then additional soil as they grow. But now's a good time to plant those dahlias in glads. It's time to give some attention to the vegetable garden, and I've already taken a little bit of time here to add some compost humus to the garden. Notice here the soil, the old soil, is really not very good. That's why I've added the compost humus. Now I'll pull some of that in over this area too. In addition, because the soil is so poor, I'm going to add for better drainage a little bit of vermiculite over the area. I think that'll help provide the drainage better in this whole bed. And I'm also going to add, be, uh, once again, because of the soil uh, being quite acid, some lime. And in this case, I'm going to add dolomite lime. And I'll just add it so that it gives a good sprinkling over the whole bed area. Like so. That's going to give us some magnesium and calcium at the same time. And then again, because the soil is so bad, I'm going to add some organic fertilizer over the top. And we'll really build this soil up so we can do a good job on the vegetables. I'm only doing a part of the bed here, by the way, because I still have some plants in the other part of the bed. I just want to give you an idea of kind of how we go about doing this in preparing the soil for this vegetable garden season. And it's really a simple process. Is what we want to do mainly is to get this organic humus mixed with this rather poor topsoil, like so. And I'll do this quickly. See how I'm trying to mix that up? so that it mixes in with that old soil pretty well. And the, and the key here in preparing any soil in any part of the garden is to get lots of organic humus and nutrients into the soil. And that's basically what we're doing here. It's a combination of both. Now, the key is very often when we've done this, we consider the job done. It's really not. It's very important that before you plant, or as soon as you get through spading, as far as that's concerned, that you take a rake and level the area. Otherwise, is what happens is if we leave any little holes in the soil like this, then when it rains, those are going to fill and you're gonna have a really damp area in your vegetable garden. And it's going to take longer for that to dry out Plus, it's going to take longer than for the crops to mature. So take a little time and prepare the vegetable garden now. You may think it's a little early, but this is the time to get after those slugs and snails in the garden. They reproduce about 250 offsprings in a single year. So the earlier you get them, the less slugs you'll have in the garden. And this is, of course, just a wooden slug because I couldn't find one today. But it's very important where you do your slug control 
methods. See, the slugs are in one area and they may be affecting a totally different area. For example, this is a drainage area, so it's moist all summer. And this is the area where they nest. Even though may, they may be doing the damage 25 feet behind us, this is where they come from. So that's where we want to concentrate our efforts. Look for low ground cover plants, look for moist areas in the garden, that's where you'll find the slugs. And get them at the point where they're nesting. Now here are a couple quick ideas. This is a pop bottle. And as you can see, all I've done is to cut it across the center like so. And then all you do is invert it into the por bottom portion. But first, of course, is what we do is take about a, oh, a teaspoon or a tablespoon. I have to set that down for a minute and grab this of slug bait and put it in the bottom here like so. See, there's the bait. Put this in upside down. Now the bait is here to attract the slugs and they crawl inside and the bait at the same time is protected from the rain and consequently once they're in there you've got them that's the end of them. and all you have to do is when that gets full is simply dump it and empty it okay and because it's green we can actually hide it back in here under the shrubs so you really don't see it at all now here's another method. This is Peter Chan, the famous Chinese gardener's favorite way of doing it. And you can do this with any one of several different types of containers. This happens to be a sour cream container, but you make these holes in the side towards the bottom of the container and make three or four of them. And I'd make them a little bit higher than that one. Again, take, oh, about a tablespoon or a teaspoon of bait, put it in the center and then cover it over like so. And by the way, I'd spray this green or brown depending upon where you're using it. And again, you can hide it in amongst the shrubs if you want to, but it attracts the slugs. They crawl inside and hopefully because it's inside, not only is it protected from the rain, but the birds and the cats and the dogs and the children won't get into it. And just to ensure, maybe put a rock or a brick on top of it. And that way you can environmentally control, you know, relatively safely the slugs and the snails in your garden. So, but get after them really early in the season. That's very important. Next, let's talk about winter composting. And we're in pretty Washington at the Pierce County compost facility and I'm with Holly Westcott of the Washington State Department of Ecology. Tell me a little bit about this facility. Well this is a, a yard waste compost facility where residents of Pierce County have their, their yard debris brought here and composted. It's a forced aeration system and it has specialized equipment here for, for and composting. And this goes through this whole process in what, about two months or something? Two to three months. It's oh, really amazing. Now, behind you here is a, is a pile of uh, debris. Is this used actually in the compost process? This particular material goes for hog fuel okay. for a boiler over in Tacoma. Normally, the yard debris that you think of, the leaves, the grass clippings, those kinds of things that come into this facility are mulched over at a separate facility and then brought here to do the actual active composting. Now, let's relate this to the home gardener. What, in winter composting, can a home gardener do composting at this time? Sure, there's an awful lot of activity that goes on that you don't see. Those microorganisms are still working even though the temperatures are, are low. Here in Washington state, we're lucky because they don't get all that low, at least on this sure. side of the state. But there's a lot of activity that goes on people collect things in the fall, but there's still composting going on there during the winter Are there months. any special things we should do, be doing um, in the composting process? Well, since we get a lot of rain here, it's a good idea to have those compost bins covered. Since all the, the water that comes with the rain will displace the air, and we need to make sure that there's lots of air for those microbes, even during the cold weather, to be working. So when you cover it, what, what would you suggest to one cover it with? Oh, some people build structures with, with just slanted roofs. A tarp would work over a compost bin, or if you have an enclosed kind of home composting bin, that would work too. 
Would, now, would you put this cover and lay it right flat, or would there be air in between? It, or? it needs to have some air space in between there because you don't want to compress the materials in the pile. Okay. Now, if you use a covering, do you need to be sure that the compost pile still gets water, or is that important? I think probably during the winter months, it's okay to just let it let it go. You can poke through with a, with a fork, a garden fork, and check it. And if it looks like it's getting dried out, leave the top off. Let the rain in at sure. it, and that would be fine. What would be some of the best things to compost at this time? Well, if there's leftover garden debris, if you didn't quite get to it in the fall, and, it, and in, you're in an area that isn't covered with snow, all of those kinds of materials, leaves, um, plants from your garden, sure. twigs, even small twigs can go in there too. Great. Thanks yeah. very much for You're sharing welcome. that information for us. And now you can compost in the garden. Our two plants of the week this week are the beautiful English daisies and what are commonly called spike plants. The English daisies, there's a couple varieties here. This, is, for example, is the pompano, which is a very attractive double flowering English daisies. And you know English daisies do well in any part of the garden. Full sun, partial sun and shade, even in full shade. And these plants are loaded with buds, so they're going to flower for a long period of time. Now, in addition to the large double flowering pompano, there are also the smaller flowering, what are called button type English daisies. And these will grow six inches as well in height. And they're loaded with buds, so they're going to flower for a long period of time. And they're very durable plants. That's a button mix, in fact, say white, reds, and pinks. And then behind here are what are called the spikes. And a spike is a dracaena. These are best used in containers during the summer season with summer flowering annuals around the base of them because they add a little bit of height. In fact, by the end of the season, they'll grow probably up to maybe three or four feet in height. And they give a really interesting texture to any container planting for the deck, the patio, the lanai, any place like that. Now, this is not a plant of the week, but I also want to share a little bit with these as long as we're here. These are hebes, or commonly called veronicas. And I've got to tell you, they're a little bit on the tender side, but in my garden this year, they, some of the varieties flowered all winter long and are in flower right now. And we'll be talking about them later in the season. But as long as we're talking about plants of the week, boy, this is one you might want to consider adding to your garden later. We're on the island of Maui in the Hawaiian Islands at the Maui Marriott Resort, and I'm with Carrie Carlucci. And Carrie, where is the Marriott uh, located? Aloha Ed, uh, the Maui Marriott is located right on Ka'anapali Beach, which is in the heart of West Maui on our beautiful island, which has been voted the best island in the world for several years now. Oh, and it's beautiful. Your gardens here are just like a botanic garden. Thank you. They're we really outstanding. We put a lot of hard work into I them. Can, oh yeah, I saw the men out here very early this morning working on the gardens. What are the flowers behind us? Um, right now you're looking at the bougainvillea, which are quite popular in tropical areas throughout North America, and also the cigar plant, which is part of the lay that you're wearing now, Ed. Oh, it's absolutely beautiful too, thank you. Do you have quite a few natives here? We do, we have um, quite a few plantings that have been introduced in the last few years through our head groundskeeper Mike. Uh, tea leaves, hala trees, which you can see up in this area, the akea bushes, and of course our napaka plants, which are located all along the beachfront way there. You know what I noticed throughout the grounds, everything kind of leads, the planting's all the way to the ocean. Yeah, they are. We're allowed, um, since the resort was built in the early 60s, we're allowed quite a close setback um, from the shoreline compared to what the regulations are now. 
looks beautiful. And is what you've also done so nicely here is to use water. There's several water features. How many? Yeah, we have about five water features in uh, various themes. You'll notice the large waterfall in the beginning of the lobby that goes down to the lower level, the tranquil Japanese garden, the pools with the waterfalls in there, and the front lobby pond. Oh, yeah. So. You know what else I noticed too, Carrie, is that you've used beautifully colors, uh, foliage colors and textures. It's really outstanding. Yeah, we try to blend a lot uh, to give our people who come back every year would like to have, you know, notice different things. So we like to give them more color, uh, lots of textures in the leaves. And the, there's so many variety of greens. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. And, and you've done such a great job. How many different types of plants would you say you have on the grounds here? Oh, it's so hard to pinpoint because there are quite a variety. I would say it's in the thousands. Yeah, it's just a magnificent collection. And so for the homeowner, you'd get all kinds of ideas. Now, I had to go to another hotel to pick this out, of course. <laughs> now, this, this is a problem that the homeowners have, though, Carrie, where very often the palms on the tips die back. Well, I just wanted right. them to know it happens in the tropics. As well. <laughs> it sure does. The wind and uh, rain causes. Yes. Yeah. Now, we have rocks throughout the gardens. Are those mm -hmm. uh, indigenous to this area? Yes, we do try to pull everything from the islands of Hawaii, uh, mostly from Maui, but of course the lava rocks, a lot of them come from the big island of Hawaii. Thanks, Carrie. The resort is beautiful. That's all the time we have today. Hope you can join me at the same time next time for Gardening in America. Mm -hmm.